Welcome to the Westminster Institute. I'm Robert Riley, its director. We are very pleased today to welcome to the Westminster Institute for the first time Cleo Pascal, who is a non-resident senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, focusing on the Indo-Pacific region, an area of the world in which she spends a great deal of time. She is particularly interested in the strategic implications of the intersection of geopolitical, geoeconomic, and geophysical change. Cleo has briefed government departments in the United States, United Kingdom, European Union, India, and many others. She's lectured at, among many others, U.S. Army War College, Center for Homeland Defense and Security, the Royal College of Defense Studies in the U.K., the National Defense College, India, and the Center for National Security Studies, Canadian Forces College. She participates in closed-door meetings with defense, intelligence, national security, and non-government experts who engage in strategic-level unclassified dialogue and research to better anticipate transnational threats. Cleo is widely published and a regular media commentator. Her books include the award-winning Global Warring, how environmental, economic, and political crises will redraw the world map. And the best-selling book in German, which she co-authored, uh, Spielball Erda. Recent academic book chapters and research papers include Is New Zealand Creating Global Disruptions? India, The Challenge of Reform, The Modi Phenomenon, Rebooting Indian Foreign Policy and the three geos, geopolitics of the Indo-Pacific. She was the guest curator, editor of the influential East-West Center series, Oceana, in 2018. In the popular media, Cleo has contributed to many distinguished newspapers and journals, The Diplomat, The Telegraph, and the UK, The Independent in the UK, South China Morning Post, BBC Radio, Australian Financial Review, <clears throat> New Zealand Herald, and the Times of India, among many others. She is currently North American Special Correspondent for the Sunday Guardian. Today, we are going to discuss the topic of preserving U.S. interest in the Indo-Pacific, examining how U.S. engagement counters Chinese influence in the region. Now, this title comes from Clio's recent, a uh, very recent congressional testimony uh, with that title. And uh, that will be part of our discussion today as Clio takes us through the extremely complicated geostrategic, geopolitical, geoeconomic situation in the Pacific Islands, which, as she reminds us in this brilliant testimony, played such a significant role in Imperial Japan's Greater East Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere, which is something that the PRC may wish to duplicate today despite U.S. presence in the region. But that's for Cleo to say and not for me. Welcome to the program. Thank you. This is uh, an enormous pleasure and honor. This is, uh, this is sort of where the, where the grown-ups uh, come, so I'm very... <laughs> I have some family members who would dispute that, but uh, but I'm here anyway, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. And you came bearing uh, gifts, uh, Cleo. You brought me ginger snap cookies from Saipan. Yes. Which I and my children will greatly appreciate. Thank you. From yes, yeah, so they are from the United States of America. Because, oh, really? because oh, Saipan is part of the Commonwealth of Northern Marianas, which is the United States of America. Right. It's it would. Uh, arguably kind of the most northwestern bit of the U.S. Um, and it, just a reminder of how much um, the U.S. is in the Pacific. Yeah, and ginger snap cookies are good. Well, take us through the strategic situation. Yeah. You, you brought with you a number of maps that helps make clear what the configurations are and how they're affiliated. Thank you, yes. It's an area that uh, many people kind of know bits and pieces about, uh, but it's very helpful to, to see the map, the, especially the strategic map as it builds up. 
So uh, we d I did bring a bunch of maps um, and it's, they're going to layer. So we'll talk about them layer by layer. And the first layer in this first map is where is the US in the Pacific? So everything that you see here in this dark blue color is actual United States of America. So you, it starts at Hawaii, but then as you go west from Hawaii, you can see Baker, Johnson, all those little atolls. A little bit further south, you see American Samoa. Then you go across and you see Guam, which has been part of America since the Spanish-American War. And then just above that, you see the Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands, which includes Saipan. And these are places that uh, they send delegates to uh, Congress, well, American Samoa, uh, CNMI, and Guam do. You know, CNMI, Guam, they're American citizens. This is American territory. So they are the front line of America's uh, strategic contest with anybody coming off of Asia who wants to push the U.S. back to Hawaii. Right? So when you go to Saipan, for example, Saipan was colonized by a whole range of people. The Germans lost them at the end of World War I. And that whole region, including CNMI, was given over to the Japanese under the League of Nations, under the South Seas Mandate. And then at terrible cost to the U.S. military, uh, they were liberated by the Marines uh, in, in 1944 and then voted to become part of the United States. I spoke to a woman in her 90s, I was there recently. She went to Japanese school. I mean, she, she learned Japanese in Japanese school as a, as a child. And then when the Americans invaded, she hid in a cave with her family for three weeks. Um, and then the Marines came. She remembers very vividly the two Marines that brought her out of the cave, gave her water to drink, brought her to safety. Uh, and then she had to learn English <laughs> and became a nun and, and then went to Kansas City, Missouri, where the, the, they had a convent for people from the Marianas who were part of this, the Mercedarians. And she became a school teacher in Kansas City, Missouri, in the public school system, to thank the Marines for having liberated her country. Oh my. So the depth of the connections of the individual people in those countries to the United States cannot be underestimated. That's the first thing to understand. They very much feel that they are Americans and that they're, they've lived through war before. They've lived through uh, civilizational conflict like is very difficult to imagine before. And they're very worried about what's coming. So it's they they've passed it on. I mean, the, the, those who were there in World War Two are are getting fewer and fewer every year, but it's it's passed on to the younger generation. So that sense that you just described is not lost. It's the the families are very tight. It's the, the these societies are very much about families, and not only that, you you see the remnants of the war all over mm -hmm. the place. So um, you know I, I, from. There, the, the cemeteries are there, the memorials are there. Um, Tinian, which is just to the south of uh, Saipan, was during World War II the, the biggest airfield, airport in the world, the biggest, mo it was the most busy. That was, they were, the B-29s were taking off consistently. That's where the Enola Gay took off from. And when you go to Tinian today, uh, two thirds of the island is leased to the US military. They're in the process of putting in a divert airfield in case there's a problem with Guam. Um, but when you walk through it, you see the, the old Japanese structures, the, the airfield they put in, the, the buildings they put in. Um, but the actual island of Tinian, which is shaped a little bit like Manhattan, when the CB showed up, they said, oh, look, it looks like Manhattan. And so they named the streets all after the streets in New York. So there's a Broadway, there's a Central Park, there's a Harlem on Tinian. There's no escaping the war and the relationship with the U.S. anywhere in that area. Uh, just to go back for a second, uh, Cleo, you mentioned earlier the idea of driving the United States back to uh, Hawaii. In your testimony, you mentioned uh, 
a general Keating. Keating and Admiral that, Keating. Could you just what yeah, so, so in 2008, uh, Admiral Keating testified to the Senate Armed Services Committee that a uh, senior Chinese officer had suggested to him, jokingly or not, I don't think it was, that uh, as China developed its naval capacity, the U.S. take Hawaii East and China will take Hawaii West and, you know, don't worry about it, we'll keep an eye on it for you, right? <laughs> now, and as you brought up, this... Uh, Greater East Asia Co Prosperity Sphere is very much like the sort of proposal Wang Yi, who's the foreign minister of uh, China at the time, was shopping around the Pacific Islands in May, June of 2022. And we'll get to that later. But it's uh, very much uh, the US pushing the US out and then, not, and then making Hawaii as unoperational as possible. So essentially pushing it back to the West Coast. And they do it in a range of ways. So when you look at a place like uh, Saipan or CNMI, uh, there is, is the Commonwealth of Northern Marianas. Yes. Northern yeah. Marianas, yeah. Yes. Um, you'll find um, there's information about Chinese funding environmental groups in order to dissuade the U.S. military from setting up training facilities. Now, there are very legitimate reasons why you'd be concerned about having two-thirds of your island leased to the U.S., but what China is very good at doing is finding legitimate concerns, inflaming those concerns, and then giving you the wrong solution, right? So you're concerned about environmental damage, which might be legitimate. Then you say your entire island's going to be destroyed, so you inflame it, and then you say the answer is you get rid of all U.S. military. That's kind of the general pathway. So we see that or that political warfare operation already on the ground. But in the case of C CNMI, Commonwealth of Northern Marianas, of which Saipan is the biggest island, when they joined the U.S., because their economy was completely different, they had a couple of concessions. One was over um, labor laws. So they didn't want U.S. minimum wage to apply because they're, they were a developing nation. The other was immigration. And the byproduct of that is still today in Commonwealth of Northern Marianas, a Chinese can arrive in Commonwealth of Northern Marianas and get a tourist visa on arrival for two weeks. No clearance, no visa application. They just show up and they get a visa. This has allowed a, a gambling sector to grow up in Saipan that included a casino that at one point was running billions a year through the casino. This is in the US. This is US. Um, and the, the amount of corruption is enormous. Now, there happens to be a new governor in CNMI at the moment. He came in six months ago and he took a look around and, and the money was just gone. And so he's come to Congress and has asked Congress, please audit me, send me more FBI agents, send me a permanent district attorney, help me clean up. Because he knows that that's how the Chinese political warfare operation comes in, distorts the politics, distorts the economics, and ultimately you end up with China <laughs> in a position that Japan was in 30 years ago, where they're controlling all of the levers, but they're below the response trigger threshold for the U.S. because U.S. is looking for kinetic and what's happening is in the political warfare realm. But you're going to find the U.S. increasingly gets locked out. Well, I noticed, uh, Cleo, that you are very conscious of the whole of government approach that the PRC takes in expanding its influence uh, in these islands through political warfare. But that political warfare has many, many aspects to it. And the United States government, in which I served for a total of 25 years on and off, not continuously, um, I, I could, uh, it, it's easy to, to see our inability to operate a whole of government effort. Yeah. Uh, we've gone to interagency meetings where everyone involved in going to Iraq is supposed to be on the same page. Everyone goes back to their own agency, and the head of agency does whatever he wants, and there's no enforcement mechanism in these interagency groups. So we're not good at whole of government. 
There are good things about that, but when you're up against a competitor like the PRC, there, there are very bad things. If I could just mention very quickly, since you've talked about the Chinese foreign minister uh, going on his tour, I, I have here a fact sheet uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, PRC, cooperation between China and Pacific Island countries. Yeah. Now, for anyone who doesn't get this as whole of government, it's very easy to see by reading this. What do we have? Section 1, Political Security Regional Affairs. Then the subset, Security Regional Affairs. Trade and Investment. Development Cooperation. Cooperation by COVID Response and Public Health. Uh, cooperation in Ocean Affairs. Uh, Disaster prevention, mitigation, climate change. Agricultural and fishery development cooperation. Um, not good at turning pages here today. I don't want to miss any of these because they're so comprehensive. Education. Yep. You mentioned Confucius Institute. Tourism, culture, women, sports, subnational cooperation. Two sides have established 22 pairs of uh, sister province, states, and cities. Um, that's a lot to pay attention to, and I guess we're, we're, we haven't been doing it. And, and unlike in the U.S., where often you'll get a press release about these sort of things and there's very little follow-up, this is actually um, a limited view of what's happening. It is backed up by the, by the infrastructure. So in every country that China has a relationship with in the Pacific, they have a very large embassy with local staff that can speak the language, have unlimited budget, have been no, has no restrictions on intel collection, have been tracking the key families for a very long time. And back in China, it's backed up by at least half a dozen think tanks that are just devoted to the Pacific Islands. So there is, this is the tip of a very big iceberg of um, a focus on the region. Now, the, now why? The question is why. The second map shows, show, in darker blue, you've got the American possessions. But you also have the three, what are called freely associated states, Palau, Federated States of Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands. And I mentioned that after World War I, Japan had this South Seas mandate, which included Commonwealth of Northern Marianas and these three countries. So Japan had, uh, the, the empire of Japan, I mean, the imperial Japan, had this entire middle Pacific zone as their colonial zone, as per the UN for 30 years. So they set up schools, they set up postal services, they set up Palau, which is on the western side, was the administrative headquarters for the South Sea Mandate. They, started, they set up the ports, they set up the airports. Now, over the years, these developed into dual-use structures. And then they developed into full-on military reinforced installations. But this is why the U.S., after Pearl Harbor, had to fight its way through those islands, island by island. So these countries across the middle, that's Kwajalein, Truk, Peleliu, Angar, all of those battles were in those countries that Japan held for 30 years as colonies and then slowly militarized with this goal of, you know, keeping the U.S. off from Hawaii east. Um, and if you, if, you, if you go there, like in Saipan again, you see a lot of Japanese activity as they were militarizing in the late 30s that looks a lot like what the Chinese are doing now. So they would say, when they were building up the airport in Saipan, which, they were, which was for military purposes, they called it a baseball field. They were clearing the ground for a baseball field, right? And they worked very closely with the Japanese businesses that were on the ground. So there was a sugar growing and refinery installation both there and elsewhere. And the sugar company worked with the Japanese government, like Chinese government companies do work with the government, gave it land and helped it when the emperor of Japan requested support to support that war, the development of the war effort. So across that entire middle zone 
Japan was in place for 30 years and setting them up like part of Japan. Now, there was a caste system, effectively, where in the case of um, Saipan, for example, um, one of the people from Saipan was explaining to me that it, it was first the Japanese, then the Koreans, then the Okinawans. Koreans and Okinawans came in to work a lot of the Japanese industries. And then the, the locals, the Chamorros or the, the other people from the region. And so the Chamorros could only go to school to grade three. But if you were half Japanese, because there was a lot of intermarriage, then you could go to grade six. So there's, that was kind of built into the structure. But at the same time, the Japanese were you know, selecting people to train for the bureaucracy. And they were settling in. And you can see it in the, in the buildings that have survived. Um, across that entire region, Marshall Islands, Federated States of Micronesia, and Palau. After World War II, um, the U.S., uh, it, it, they reverted to the successor of the League of Nations, to the UN, to the United Nations. And the United Nations handed that entire zone, which is larger than the continental United States, to the U.S. for uh, administration. And that area was called the Trust Territories. And it was the only strategic trust territory the UN designated. So those three countries, what are now countries, plus the Commonwealth of Northern Marianas, were administered under this trust territory structure by the United States. The area that's Marshall Islands now was an area where the US conducted 67 nuclear tests between the late 40s and early 50s. So Castle Bravo, the Bikini Atoll, that stuff, that all happened in the Marshall Islands. Over uh, the course of the years, those countries, it's a, they're, they each have their own story and they're all very complicated but Commonwealth of Northern Marianas decided to join the U.S. The other three countries decided to become countries, go independent. But they signed what's called, each of them, their own Compact of Free Association with the United States. So those three countries collectively are known as the Freely Associated States. So whether, whether you call them a compact state or freely associated state, it means the same thing. That compact... That those agreements means that those three countries are the closest strategic partners the U.S. has ever had. They give the U.S. essentially unlimited defense and security responsibilities over their land and their waters. The U.S. can say, we want to put a base there, and that's it. It also gives the people of the three freely associated states the right to live and work in the U.S. and join the U.S. military. And they do. They do at rates that are higher than most U.S. states. So the current um, compact negotiator, the, 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 the compacts are up for renewal now, the current lead negotiator for the Federated States of Micronesia is a retired U.S. Marine colonel. So the ties are, are incredibly deep. They were born in the blood of World War II, the incredible sacrifice of both sides during World War II. Uh, and they uh, resulted in this, from a strategic perspective, unbelievable access that the US has to go from basically Hawaii to Guam unimpeded. So we talk about always, we talk about the first island chain, maybe the second island chain, but that presupposes you can get there. You can only get there because of the freely associated states. So what does that mean? The first island chain being, being the arc uh, between Japan and... Yeah, Japan, Taiwan, Philippines. It's what hems China in to the South China Sea area and what China's trying to break. Right? They're building the military bases, the islands of the South China Sea, that gets them closer to, that, to being able to break it. But ultimately, it's why they want Taiwan, so that they can break the chain that constrains them. But Taiwan is not the end. Taiwan is the necessary starting point for the rest of it. Once you have Taiwan, your security perimeter for Taiwan goes out to those Pacific islands, and it helps you to project power even more towards Hawaii and down and across. So Taiwan is not the end point. Taiwan is... But you're bottled up if you don't have Taiwan. But, but if you don't break the chain, you're bottled up. 
And the U.S. has been saying, we're reinforcing the chain, we're reinforcing the chain, we'll keep, but they're not looking at what's behind them, not looking at what's happening with those compact states. Just to talk about the second chain before we get... Yeah, so the second chain comes, again, because... So these are vague, vague right. thing, but um, yeah. So you've got uh, that first chain, which is sort of Japan, uh, Taiwan, Philippines, Malaysia. The second is kind of broadly Japan, Commonwealth of Northern Marianas, Guam, and then kind of down that way, maybe Palau. I mean, it depends on where you put Palau. So you've got these sort of reinforcement zones, and the U.S. has substantial troops along the, and, and treaty allies. You know, you have troops in Japan, you have the treaty allies in the Philippines. If you're looking at that strategic map, you feel like you've got it covered. And in fact, that's the third map. You've got the U.S. states, then you have the, those three compact states that get you across the Central Pacific. Then you have the five treaty allies. You have Japan, South Korea, Philippines, Australia, and Thailand. And so if you're looking at that map and you're sitting in Indo-PACOM, and you're not looking at the sort of things that you just talked about in terms of political warfare, you think you have it covered. The kinetic warfare map is reassuring. You've got your treaty allies, you have your defense rights. In the case of the compacts, you have strategic denial. Also, you can say no other militaries can go into Palau, Marshall Islands, or Federated States of Micronesia. So you think you're good. Uh, and on top of that, there are four countries in there that recognize Taiwan. So that's the next map overlaid on top is Palau and Marshall Islands, which are two of the compact states, also recognize Taiwan, plus Nauru and Tuvalu. Now, the reason it's important to recognize Taiwan is because we talked about those, that those embassies, what those embassies do in those countries. If you have a Taiwanese embassy, you don't have this massive Chinese spy base, which is the, the Chinese embassy sitting in your country, ready to run operations with all of its, you know, with its diplomatic pouches and its budget and its intel collection there. You have a Taiwanese embassy, which is helpful as opposed to, a, a, I mean, it's a forward operating base on a political warfare battlefield. For so, China. For China, yeah. So so four of those countries have that. So you've got this, this map where you've got U.S. territory in Guam, in Commonwealth and Northern Marianas. Uh, you have all the little ones. You've got American Samoa, which is very helpful when the Chinese are trying to get to Central or South America because they have to go through that area. So American Samoa is very important for moderate, monitoring that, that trans-Pacific trade or activity. And then you've got the compacts, which go right across the middle, the freely associated states, where you can do whatever you want. You have as much access, probably more, than you do on the U.S. homeland. Then you have the treaty allies, who are sitting there, supposedly, with kind of reciprocal defense agreements. And then you have the four countries that recognize Taiwan, adding another layer of defense. So you can sit in OPECOM and think, we're good. But then you add in what you just talked about. This is not the battlefield China is playing on. They're not looking at that kinetic, uh, overt defense treaties, military bases, access. They're operating in, in what some people called gray zone, but I, I think it's not a particularly accurate term, where they're coming in with the fishing fleet instead of a naval militia. But that fishing fleet is dropping buoys, it's tracking, um, you know, they, they're running the research vessels. Palau said that they've got the Chinese research vessels going up and down their cables. They're buying off politicians. They're, they're signing this sort of agreement. The things that you're talking about in that agreement are those proposals, like education that's getting into their heads, um, customs and immigration, forensics, uh, medical. These are all things that give you a level of societal control if that's your inclination. So that's where we get to this last map in this series, which is the countries that were visited by Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi in May and June of 2022. And if you see where he visited, he completely jumped over the defensive perimeter. And the reason that it's worth noting the countries that he visited is because this was the height of COVID. All of these countries had closed borders. So they had to make a political decision 
we are going to waive all of our COVID restrictions to let in Wang Yi and his delegation. And we're going to muzzle our own press and we're going to have quiet meetings that we don't talk to anybody else about. So it's a proxy indication of level of um, political leverage that China had over those countries. And if you look at the compact states, none of them, there, two of them recognize Taiwan, so he couldn't have gone there. But the one in the middle, Federated States of Micronesia, does recognize China. And they had a president at the time, President Panuelo, who did not allow a visit from Wang Yi. And in fact, he wrote a letter, public letter. He's written three letters. This letter he wrote saying, what is being proposed by the Chinese is the most, um, I can't remember the exact term he used, but it was sort of the most uh, consequential proposal of our lifetimes. May, may I read part of that letter, which, which you include in your testimony? Yes. And this, uh, by this very courageous man. Hugely, yeah. Who was still the president of the Federated States of Micronesia when he issued uh, the last of them, though unfortunately he was not re-elected. We can talk about that also. Okay, but yeah. let's, here it is. Yeah. <clears throat> Quote from uh, President Panuelo, the single most game-changing proposed agreement in the Pacific in any of our lifetimes. I am aware that the bulk of Chinese research vessel activity in the FSM has followed our nation's fiber optic cable infrastructure, just as I am aware that the proposed language in this agreement opens our countries up to having our phone calls and emails intercepted and overheard. Now I'm bouncing around in here. However, of Chinese control over our security space, aside from the impacts on our sovereignty, is that it increases the chances of China getting into conflict with Australia, Japan, the United States, and New Zealand on the day when Beijing decides to invade Taiwan. To be clear, that, that's a China long-term goal, to take Taiwan peacefully if possible, but through war if necessary. Uh, one of the reasons that China's political warfare is successful in so many areas is that we are bribed to be complicit and bribed to be silent. That's a heavy word, but it is an accurate description regardless. What else do you call it when an elected official is given an envelope filled with money after a meal at the PRC embassy or after an inauguration? What else do you call it when a senior official is discreetly given a smartphone after visiting Beijing? What do you call it when an elected official receives a check for a public project that our national treasury has no record of and uh, no means of accounting for. This is a very frank statement and, and he faces the consequences, possible consequences of having made it. Yes. So I close with this quote from President Panuelo. I am acutely aware that informing you all of this presents risks to my personal safety, the safety of my family, and the safety of the staff I rely on to sort me in this work. I inform you regardless of these risks, because the sovereignty of our nation, the prosperity of our nation, and the peace and stability of our nation are more important. Wow. There are some real heroes in the Pacific who are fighting hard to preserve their sovereignty. So we talked about what happened 80 years ago in the Pacific in terms of kinetic warfare. The, they're on the front lines of political warfare, but political warfare underplays the physical risk to the people involved in fighting this battle. It sounds clean. It's not. You know, people, uh, it, it is extremely dangerous. And what President Panuelo did, so, that, so the, the first quote was directly related to this Wang Yi visit. It was the letter he sent out when Wang Yi visited those countries that are in red on the map. And um, he, he wrote three letters in all. I think as soon as he wrote the first letter, he was probably marked, you know. And um, it's often said that when Wang Yi went through the area, he presented uh, China Pacific Island's vision, which was very much in the, in, in the terminology of the greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere including a five-year plan to accomplish that vision. Um, 
the media generally reports it as a failure because it wasn't signed. I don't think that was the intention of presenting it. And, and he presented it in the middle of the trip on a virtual meeting. Like if you're really serious about it, you meet everybody one-on-one, -on -one, then you have a big meeting at the end. I think what he was doing was uh, finding who is going to be amenable to that sort of an arrangement and who was going to object. And if they are amenable, you help their political career. And if they object, you try to destroy them. And they caught Penuelo. They caught President Penuelo. So the point of the meaning, meaning he didn't win every election. You know, they identified people across the Pacific who were concerned about this sort of an agreement with China. And they also identified the ones who were willing to sign. So the purpose of the trip was an intelligence operation. I would, I would argue it was, yeah. I, I find uh, why your testimony and your other writings on this area, Cleo, are so valuable is reading the CRS, uh, reading uh, the RAND study, reading the Peace Institute study. Some of them very good, make good yeah. points. None of them have said that. You're the one who said this was what was really going on. The other ones just say, well, this was a failure. But yeah. Not, not in the terms that you just presented. Yeah. Be so I, I can tell you why I why I think why you know so I I'm trying to look at it from the point of view of how I've seen China operate in other locations, right? So I'm not I'm not a Pacific Island expert. I'm not even a China expert. But what I look at is China's political warfare, and I look at how it's countered. So countries like India are actually very good at countering it. And we can talk about that if you want. And I learn a lot about how the Indians fight the Chinese and the political warfare front because they've had the same problem in their Indian Ocean Islands as we've had in the Pacific Ocean Islands, which is also why you see the Indian security establishment understanding what's going on in the Pacific to the point where Prime Minister Modi in May went to Papua New Guinea because he's very concerned that the West is not... Um, giving the Pacific Island leaders what they need to defend themselves from China. And they've looked at the World War II map also, and they know that the Japanese got all the way through the Straits to Andaman Islands. And they've, so they've got the Chinese coming down through the Pacific Ocean into the Indian Ocean, coming down through Pakistan, through the Pakistan, uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, and they're starting to feel surrounded. So they've realized if the US and Australia and New Zealand are dropping the ball in the Pacific Islands, they're gonna to have to get involved. Just to go back to an earlier uh, misstep, misstep is too mild a term to characterize this. Under the Obama administration, uh, China claimed uh, sovereignty over almost all of the South China Sea mm -hmm. and proceeded with building those airfields and dual use places yes. and then installing military equipment on them, and there was not much of an objection voice. I personally, when I watched this happening, thought this is perhaps the most audacious geopolitical move uh, in my lifetime. I mean, I think you'd have to go back to uh, Nazi Germany's early moves in uh, before World yeah. War II broke out, and there, there was no indication of anyone taking this seriously. So the people in the region took it very Thank seriously. You. Yeah, the Philippines, I mean, it, ha it was, I mean, this Scarborough Shoals specifically. Right, oh, sure. Yeah, um, and, and that was, it, it was one of the first shaking faith in, in U.S. position. That's what I would think. Yeah, and it's, it's been really heartbreaking to watch because um, in the Pacific Islands, the, 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 the fighting was horrific. I mean, all, all war is inconceivably awful. But what the men of the United States and, and allies and people on the ground did and had to do in those islands is uh, heartbreaking. I mean, it's just what, what it had to do to them as human beings and how many were lost and how many, you know, never fully recovered. And, you know, it, it was the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Guadalcanal uh, over the summer. Um, Solomon Islands, that's in Solomon Islands. Solomon Islands is a, a country that used to recognize Taiwan. In 2019, they switched to China. And just this week, uh, 
the uh, Prime Minister of Solomon Islands has been in China. And when he landed in China, he said, it's good to be home. Okay? This is who, you, who we're dealing with. Uh, we, we, the greater whoever, could have gotten rid of him in the first six months because he was taking Chinese money and it was and his group was and it was being laundered through is being laundered through Australian banks and Australian real estate. Go after him on corruption charges. That's what we're supposed to do, right? Disproportionate assets. Do an investigation, and if you find him guilty, no more visa to any Western country. And if he sets foot, throw him in jail. It would have changed the dynamics immediately. Instead, let it fester. And, and they signed this agreement, the security agreement with China, according to the draft agreement. At this point, he can invite the PLA in to put down domestic dissent, and he can, uh, and, the, and China can send troops in to protect Chinese businesses in the Solomon Islands. And so at the commemoration of the Battle of Guadalcanal, you had uh, Ambassador Carolyn Kennedy, whose father was, life was saved by Solomon Islanders, and uh, Wendy Sherman, whose father was also involved at the commemoration, and the Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands didn't show up. So to me, this loss is not just, uh, it's, it's morally reprehensible. When the, the provisions of this agreement were announced, that sent shockwaves through Australia yep. and New wow. Zealand, right? I mean, they were, I mean, I knew about it. We knew this was coming months before, and I have no special information. They, this was not a surprise to the people, to, or it shouldn't have been. If, they, if it was a surprise, they should have been fired. But to people involved, I mean, we were getting information, uh, and in fact, we, it was all published. We published it about the, 30, the names of the 39 out of the 50 members of parliament in the Solomon Islands who got money directly from a Chinese slush fund which was enough, a big enough number to change the constitution in order to delay elections, which is what they've done. I mean, I, I interviewed uh, um, the Honorable Peter Canalaria, who is a member of parliament, who's the son of the first prime minister of the Solomon Islands. And he said when they were in the process of doing that, getting in those 39 out of the 50, he said, they're gonna wanna use this number to delay elections. And it took almost a year, but that's exactly what they did. But that was published. That we pub it's public. So if they were caught, the Australians who were caught by surprise weren't doing their job. And uh, you know we saw this building. We could have cut it off sooner. And this this goes to how do you fight? How do you fight this? Right. Just before you go into yeah, that, please. explain the strategic position that puts Australia. In. Right. Australian with the Chinese, you know, maybe we'll assume with military yeah. facilities on the Solomon Islands. If we bring up that map again, that last map that has what's in red, which is where Wang Yi visited. We tend to talk about the first island chain off the coast of China, which hems in China, right? This map shows China attempting to build an island chain off the coast of Australia, which will hem in Australia. Right, which will keep it from being able to come to the defense of Taiwan or for us. Yeah, so w we can't supply them. They and that's why, you know, th that's why Japan rushed down to try to grab it at the, those same locations at the beginning of World War II. And w one of the first places in the Solomon Islands that the Japanese tried to take was a place called Tulagi, which had, was the British headquarters of that region. There, the, the geography doesn't change. It's a good port. It's you know easy to defend all that stuff. So that so the 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 British had set up there. The Japanese tried to grab it. And then the Americans had to liberate it. Eighty years later, the Chinese signed their you know got got them to flip to China and they tried to buy it. Tulagi was the, one of the first targets. Was Tulagi, right? They've been sitting there studying the World War II maps from our side, from the Japanese side, from everybody's side, figuring out what mistakes everybody made, what locations are important, what airfields can still be rehabilitated, you know, what ports need to be dredged, how you can say this is a fisheries port that we're building here, just like it was a baseball field that they were building in Saipan, and start to put in place this infrastructure that including telecoms, including cables, including Huawei. What, the other thing they did in Solomons, 
They got the Solomon Islands government to take out a $66 million loan to put in Huawei towers. There you go. Right? And so what, are, what is the West doing? There was the premier of one province in the Solomon Islands, a guy called Daniel Sudani, who tried to stand up. And he did it. He issued uh, what's called the Aoki Communique. This was in 2019. And in it, he says, we don't want any CCP-linked businesses operating in our province. And it's, it's on moral grounds. We don't like how the Chinese operate. And also, we believe in freedom of religion. And we are uh, Christian people. And we don't want to do business with a systemically atheist country. And so they blocked CCP investments. So when the Huawei towers were going up, he wouldn't let them set up in his province. So the Chinese put tens of millions, tens of millions of dollars on the ground to try to buy the political opposition to get rid of Sudani. And they succeeded. And he came, he tried to come to the US to tell the US what was going on. He went to Fiji and he applied for a visa to the US and his visa was denied. Okay. So it was denied at the same time when uh, uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, uh, SAR, as he's called, Dr. Kurt Campbell, was on his way to the Solomon Islands for a visit. Congressman Dunn, who's on the China Select Committee, wrote a letter asking, why was this man's visa denied? And uh, a bipartisan letter went from Congresswoman Radwagon and Congressman Case to Secretary Blinken saying, why was this man's visa denied? And he was finally given a visa and he was allowed to come to the U.S. Jump forward to uh, the meeting in Papua New Guinea with Blinken, with Secretary Blinken. I don't know if you remember, but in May, on May 22nd, there was a meeting that had been convened by the Indians, the... President Biden was supposed to come, he canceled, Secretary Blinken came, he posed for a picture with Pacific Island leaders. Uh, the Prime Minister of Solomon Islands was there, but he wouldn't pose for the picture with Secretary Blinken because he told other leaders the U.S. was harboring a criminal. <laughs> right? So this man who is willing to stand up to China is being targeted to the degree that this message- well, He's the criminal? Yeah. The criminal is okay. Daniel Sudani, who tried to stop the Huawei towers from going into his, and by the way, as soon as they got him out of power, within a week, the Huawei survey crews were on the ground in his province. So it is, it, it, it's like, he's a man like former President Panuelo. There are these incredibly courageous people on the ground who, if it wouldn't have been for Congress, wouldn't even get a visa to the U.S. But President, former President Panuelo should be sitting in D.C. at a think tank briefing people about how the PRC operates. By the way, I just I came across this reflection from a senior fellow with the International Institute for Strategic Studies, Singapore, Juan Graham, speaking of that Solomon, significance of Solomon and so forth. Quote, you only have to look at a map to deduce the basic logic of what China is up to. This is prime real estate. Most of it is water, but you connect up those islands, archipelagos, and that's an island chain that runs between Australia and the United States, between Australia and Japan. We know that China sees that as the first of many. So he notices, as you say, yeah, yeah. people in the region. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's very good. Yeah, yeah. Colonel Newsham knows this very well. I mean, they're, oh, yes. yeah, yeah. Colonel Newsham is very good on this topic. And he was part, he testified at that same hearing. Yeah. Well, now that you've mentioned Grant, who is a friend of both of ours and, and most particularly of yours, I, I first met you when you came with Grant to do a program. Well, yeah, he needed a chauffeur and I had yeah, a car. And, uh, <laughs> that's when we featured his book, when China attacks a warning to America, which I believe is a bestseller from Regnery Books. The other thing about your work, Cleo, that is so distinctive is you explain the whole of government approach and the political warfare China's conducting in the islands, but you never leave out corruption and organized crime. Yes. 
that's often not in these other studies of what of what's taking place. Could so let's yeah. you've talked about the corruption buying the, the members of the parliament to pass the constitutional change, the bribery, the identification of political opposition, the envelopes of money and so forth. Tell tell us about the PRC is using organized crime to, to do this? Uh, yeah, so, so... And some removed, so they're not tainted by it, or how does that work? <clears throat> and what do they do? So I learned a lot about this from another person, uh, Kerry Gershanek, who's written a lot about this political warfare activity stuff. We've had him on yeah. the program. The way it operates, so what you could see it in places like Hong Kong, is okay, so just at, just at a macro level, before I get down to the ground level, um, when China comes into a country... They pre- usually present a commercial face. We're here to do business. We just want to help your economy develop. And that's a very, it's an easy sell because the West has really not helped these economies, in part because they're, they're, a, very poor mis- they're a very poor match. They kind of, the Australian economy has, doesn't match, unless it's resources, an economy like Papua New Guinea. That's why India is kind of interesting because the Indian economy does. It has village level economics. It has kind of lower cost, but efficient sort of thing. Things that Western economies can't develop. So it's it's why it's a unique quad partner from an economic security perspective. But but getting back to that. So they come in, the Chinese come in and say, economic development, I'll help you with economic development. But that's always intertwined with a strategic goal right? So we'll help you develop your fisheries, but we're going to take control of your port, which may then have dual use implications, right? But don't worry, we'll cover, you know, the customs and immigration stuff, and we'll help you set up all those systems, which is where you always, you get that third element, which is corruption. Now, the criminal activity can vary. It can be bribery, that the sort of stuff they were talking about, but often it's on the ground triad activity. Really? Yeah, so in a case like Palau, right, which is a compact state, it recognizes Taiwan. One of the most infamous triad leaders, Broken Tooth, was operating out of Palau. And the Palau, Palau officials arrested close to 200 uh, Chinese people who were running illegal gambling operations out of Palau. Now, you might think that's not linked into the government, but what happens is in order to get your legal operations going, you're bribing people. So you're co-opting mem- people in the government. You're figuring out who can be bribed. And they might think it's just for a little money on the side for this little gambling thing. But as per the 2017 national intelligence law in China, any Chinese citizen or company has to support Chinese intelligence operations. That's the law. You're punished if you don't, you're rewarded if you do. So the Chinese, the CCP or the MSS or whoever will let the Chinese organized crimes operate as almost advanced shock troops and they'll deploy them for specific operations when required, but they are, they can't exist without Chinese government or CCP acceptance, right? They'd be shut down, they'd be killed. I mean, it's not a nice system. So they know what the parameters are and if they are of service to the state, if the government official they're buying off to get in their meth is uh, also useful for smuggling in intelligence gathering equipment, then they get rewarded by the state. So it's, it's difficult to quantify because it's a different way of operating than how we operate, but it's almost like a self-funding um, intelligence and enforcement arm of the CCP on the ground. I mean, the, the problems are pervasive. What do we do about it? What do we do about it? What do we do about it, right? And you need to offer, you get right back to the core thing, which is this economic development thing. You need to offer some sort of viable economic development. There are good people who are working on that. But you're not operating on a level playing field. So you need to block the malign activity while you're building. You need to go after the corruption so that your engagement has a chance because no matter how good your project is, it will be undermined by Chinese agents because it's not Chinese. It's a zero sum game for them, right? If you've got a healthy American company building infrastructure in Solomons, that's a loss for China. So you will be attacked. You, you won't know why. Projects will slow down. You won't get visas. 
um, things will disappear. You know, somebody might get robbed. An individual might be intimidated at a bar, but not directly related to the project, not directly related to whatever. Is you're going to be have a very hard time operating. Plus, American construction companies probably can't compete. They can compete on a level playing field, mm-hmm. and that's the point. You need to block the malign activity and build at the same time. You need to go after the corruption. You, and it's not just, it's, you need to expose it, but then you have to prosecute it. Currently, there is no downside to taking Chinese money in a place like Solomon Islands. Nothing. One governor, or a, a, could have been head of state, I'm trying to remember, I believe it's in your, your paper, uh, said we, we, we know about the human traffic. We know about yeah. the, we know about all these things. We don't need another meeting with you about it. We need the means to, uh, in place enforcement. We need FBI agents. We need, That's we right. need just what you were talking about instead of another seminar. Yes. I mean, they don't, they don't want more workshops. You know, they want, right. yep. There's a, a, a lot of discussion about maritime domain awareness. That's kind of the, the current thing at the moment. And that is important. But if you know what's there and you're not doing anything about it, that that's incredibly frustrating for the innovative. for these for these countries. Yeah, on top of that, uh, we haven't uh, specifically talked about the Belt and Road Initiative yes. from the PRC and how that's operating in the islands. So, so the Belt and Road Initiative, the acronym is BRI. Um, uh, I like to refer to it as the Bribery and Repression Initiative, <laughs> yeah. uh, because what's actually being exported is a system of operating which is bribery and repression in order to get your projects in. So whether the bridge goes up or not, along the way, you're bribing people and repressing people and you're training the local bureaucracy and the local government in how to behave. You're metastasizing the Chinese system into the region. And you, is that the, the repression side? Yes, mm-hmm. the repression and, and, the, and the illicit finance, the bribery side. So this is a very, this is something that I'm s- starting to take a look at. So I'm still developing it. And if anybody out there has more information or thinks I'm wrong, let me know so I don't go down a dead end. Um, well, there's, a, there's enough of record where the BRI is operated elsewhere in the world and what is left in its wake. What I think is happening now, because you're starting to see, you know, the official numbers for BRI funding declining because what I think is happening is they've got in, they've gotten into the World Bank and Asian Development Bank process. So the ADB and World Bank are funding infrastructure projects built by the Chinese. It's just staggering. Yeah. So the BRI is continuing, but we're funding it. <laughs> so why put the Chinese funds at risk when they can be largely ours? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's what's starting to happen. And you can see it in projects like in Marshall Islands, which is compact state, recognizes Taiwan. One of the major World Bank infrastructure projects is being done by a Chinese company. You saw it in Malaita province, too, in the Solomon Islands, where the bridge and and the contracts sometimes get rigged so that nobody else will bid for the original contract except the Chinese. And then once the Chinese get the contract, the terms are changed so that it's much more lucrative on behalf of the Chinese. That's what happened in Malaita province. So, you know, I think that it, 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 these agencies that you, you might think are Western agencies and offer an alternative, you really need to l- look at the fine print because we know it's been a priority of, of China to get into international multilateral organizations and to use them to advance CCP interests. With the, the element of influence the United States used to have, or supposedly should have, in both the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, yeah. Um, what is that just a, a neglect and oversight or a loss of influence or is it a, a, an attempt to cultivate China and you know you'll be a responsible stakeholder if we make you part of this kind of thing? Our systems are not designed to be protected against political warfare and, dis- and distorted economics. So it's the lowest bid. That's that's what we're. Su- we're designed for. It's the lowest bid. And that's also why you have problems with contractors, military contractors in places like Palau. They've had problems with contracts going to subcontractors and creating environmental problems on the ground that then reflect badly on the U.S., for example. 
So this whole kind of, it just goes to the lowest bidder without seeing what the strategic context for that is, means that things are happening on the ground that, uh, that, that it may have made sense if the end of history ever actually existed. But in a, uh, this sort of a strategic contest on a political warfare battlefield is um, uh, you're subsidizing the enemy. And there's no lesson learned from what happened in Sri Lanka or the, the, the terrible position this has placed Pakistan. Its lesson has been learned in India, and so that's why they're they won't participate. They're doing a bunch of different things, but I mean, just to give an idea of the advanced nature of the engagement uh, of China on this, the Maldives, which is a Pacific Island, uh, an Indian Ocean island nation off the coast of India highly strategically important for India, like Solomon's would be, for example, for Australia. Uh, it's a democracy and they had an election coming up and it seemed like the pro-Indian leader was going to win, but the pro-China leader won. And when they started looking into it, what had happened was the Chinese had bought off the overseas Maldivian vote in Sri Lanka to do mail-in voting for the Chinese candidate. So they were looking at what was happening on the ground in Maldives. They weren't watching what was happening in Sri Lanka. And we have a very similar situation now in the Marshall Islands, which is coming up for a vote in November. This recognizes Taiwan, a home of Kwajalein missile base, has not signed the compact. We, we didn't really get into that, but right now <laughs> we're in a cycle where the, the compacts are perpetual. Right, they can be consistently renewed until one of the countries pulls out. These are the three countries that give Palau, Marshall Islands, Ferry States, and Micronesia. They give complete defense oversight to the U.S. That's what allows the U.S. to operate from Hawaii to Guam, get all the way across. Um, at this very moment, the financial and services component are are, are being renegotiated. It happens l roughly every 20 years. If they're not approved by Congress by September 30th these countries fall off a financial cliff and China's waiting at the bottom to catch them, right? So Palau and Micronesia, Federated States of Micronesia, have signed an MOU and have agreed terms of the deal and that's ready to go to Congress. Marshall Islands signed an MOU, changed negotiators, is now saying it doesn't recognize its own MOU and, it, and doesn't agree with the deal. So Marshall Islands is, and there's about 20 legislative days left to get this thing passed by Congress. So the Marshall Islands is sort of, is a, is a complete disaster. Like this is Kwajalein Missile Base. This is, you know, it's, it, and there's, there's kind of no a, attention being, being paid to why that's happening. So we know that there is an enormous amount of Chinese political warfare on the ground, including in the past few years. This is going to sound crazy. This is going to sound like, why didn't we all hear about this story? But, but please look it up. It's, it happened. Um, two Chinese bought Marshall Island citizenship and then tried to set up what was openly being called a country within a country on Rongelap Atoll, which would have its own uh, immigration, taxation, its own whole system. They brought legislators from Marshall Islands, including a former president, to Hong Kong and got them to say this two systems, one country thing is great and we want to set up a Hong Kong in the Marshall Islands, right next to Kwajalein in a country that recognizes Taiwan. They paid off members of the legislature and officials in marshals to the point where they were within one vote of getting it passed. Then COVID came around. Then suddenly somebody woke up in DC and they got arrested in the Philippines, deported to New York where they faced charges. They took a plea deal, which means the names of the people in marshals who took the money never became public. It also means they got a very reduced sentence to the point where there's a man and a woman. The woman has finished her sentence. 
and the FBI in April deported her back to the Marshall Islands. Perfect. So she is now wandering around free because the FBI never gave the case files to the Attorney General of the Marshall Islands so he could either prosecute her or the people who took the money leading up to an election at a time when the compact negotiations are going on. You talked about at the beginning, joined up government. It would be nice if just like one department had an act together. Speaking of of neglect, in in your congressional testimony, you mentioned, Cleo, that President Panuelo had offered to recognize Taiwan. Yes. And no response? Was what what wasn't picked up on? What happened? This is one of the I mean, it's kind of uh, heartbreaking. So, yes, President Panuelo uh, was in negotiations with the Taiwanese to de-recognize China and recognize Taiwan. And that that's very important. So remember, this is the middle of the three compact countries, a key part of U.S. defense architecture. It would have closed the Chinese embassy in that location. You know, it would have incredibly beneficial for the people of FSM, but also for uh, for U.S. and and all of Indo-Pacific security. The Japanese, everybody would have benefited. And he knew the risk he was taking, as you quoted from the letter, and he was willing to do it. Um, I uh, I went to Taiwan after the letter came out. Talked to the Taiwanese. Talked to others. The Taiwanese couldn't move without State Department approval. The Taiwanese are on a very short leash. And apparently, State Department didn't want it to happen. Any explanation? I mean, I, I mean, everybody can come to their own conjecture, but, you know, it would have been a problem. It would have been work. It would have, the Chinese would have, potentially literally gone ballistic, <laughs> you know, but it's the right thing to do. Um, the, the um, you know, I, I, mysterious are the ways of the State Department to me. China has been winning the narrative battle, especially around recognition. They will go to these countries and say, there's, I think, 13 left, and say, you don't want to be the last country standing, you know come over to China now and you'll get a better deal than when you're the last one, right? But if the narrative changes and countries are escaping from the Chinese orbit, that blows a hole in their narrative. So it would have been a globally important move, not just strategically, but in terms of the battle for narrative. But it didn't happen. So now China can go around and say, State Mm -hmm. why why even try to go to Taiwan? State Department isn't going to back you. And imagine how demoralizing it is to Taiwan. Well, as we wrap up here, Cleo, your current assessment of the situation, maybe even any reaction to your congressional testimony, is is there a rising awareness um, in Congress and in, in think tanks, um, maybe even in the executive branch, that this is a dangerous situation for the United States and some action has to be taken? Definitely in Congress, and that's in part thanks to the leadership of, as we saw the very first map, all of those pieces of the U.S. in the Pacific, they have delegates in Congress. So uh, the delegate from uh, Marianas, from Guam, from Hawaii, um, from American Samoa, they've, they're have they now all on an Indo-Pacific task force set up by natural resources uh, in the House. Okay. I see the, the questioning look about natural resources. Right, yes. This goes back to how out of date U.S. Uh, bureaucratic infrastructure is. Natural resources has a subcommittee on Indian and insular affairs. The insular affairs part of it dates back to the trust territories time when they were administering that zone across the Pacific, the Marianas and those th- as under the UN, under this um, trust territory agreement. And then when they became independent countries, they never escaped from that bureaucratic Mm -hmm. structure. So there is now a question about whether maybe there should be a freely associated state desk set up at state that is permanent. So there isn't a panic every 20 years and you can maintain the relationship with some institutional knowledge. So to your point, 
uh, if we can get some institutional changes. Currently on the NSC, the person covering all of the Pacific Islands also covers Southeast Asia. <laughs> right? So I would argue, first you need somebody just for the Pacific Islands, but you also need somebody just for the FAS because they are the backbone of the U.S.'s ability to deploy across the Pacific and to secure our treaty part, your, your treaty partners, and to be able to reinforce the first island chain. And the relationship with those three countries is like nothing the U.S. has with anywhere else. And you need to understand it to understand how to protect it, because if, if we don't protect it, uh, you know, it is it is, I would argue, one of the top three or four priorities for China to destroy the relationship between the U.S. and those freely associated states. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time right now, and I'd like to thank our guest, Cleo Pascal, who is a senior non-resident fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, for joining us today to discuss a recent congressional testimony titled Preserving U.S. Interests in the Indo-Pacific examining how U.S. engagement counters, I'll just add, should counter, Chinese influence in the region. Uh, I thank you for joining us today, and I invite you to go to the Westminster Institute YouTube channel, where you will find our other offerings, including several programs by Grant Newsham, who we mentioned earlier, uh, other programs on Japan, China, Taiwan, uh, Ukraine, Russia, war. Jack Ziak, that's an amazing one. We have quite a, a litany and uh, an array of subject matters in which I hope you will be interested. Thank you for joining us. I'm Robert Riley.